We got UFC Vegas 97 coming up this week. But guys, I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer here. We're shooting for a little over 50% on this card because why? Well, there's a lot of big time underdogs. And even if I think that the favorites might be like, you know, a rightful favorite, they shouldn't be that big of a favorite. So we're going with a lot of dogs this week. We're going to sprinkle some dogs and see what happens because here's the deal. If you hit, if you're hitting dogs at like 50%, you end up coming up on top on the money, but you also, sometimes your picks don't look the best. We would love to get 100% on this card, but I don't think it's going to happen. So adjust your expectations reasonably. We're going for some, we're going dog hunting today. So tune in, check out the underdogs I like, check out all the links in the description if you would like to do so. And I will see you guys in the first fight of the night coming up right up. The ultimate fighter finale for the featherweights in this matchup. And what's interesting here is this is something of a meet in the middle contest for these two guys, because we've got Nathan Fletcher, who typically was a bantamweight prior to the ultimate fighter. And we have uh, Gigamontis Ramashka, who is, well, previously was a lightweight. And now here he is a featherweight. So, Ramashka is going to be bigger by a pretty good clip, and I don't think that's you know hard to understand with what I just said. So at featherweight, where they meet in the middle, the size may play a factor. But for Nathan Fletcher, the guy's only got one loss in the career. He's four and one in, in his last five fights. He did lose on the on the Ultimate Fighter. Those are considered exhibitions. That does not count. Uh, for Ramashka, four and one in his last five as well. Something interesting about Ramashka is is he had a um, it was like this. Uh, it was MMA, but it was in a ring, but it was like two fights in the same night. And uh, that's kind of impressive to win both of them in the same night. Um, but he did that, you know, not too long ago before, like a little before the Ultimate Fighter as well. Um, so that's that's kind of an impressive thing to add. So I just wanted to point that out real quick. But when we look at Nathan Fletcher, he's fought for Cage Warriors, which is probably the better um, level of competition overall, just in general. I mean, Cage Warriors are going to see higher higher name recognition, at least. Let's put it that way. Um, so there is that. He's got more exposure, but Ramashka has bought some pretty wild situations, apparently. So here we go. Uh, for Nathan Fletcher, if you just watched the um, the Ultimate Fighter, you might not know all of this, but I would say that Nathan Fletcher actually is a decent striker. He's got decent boxing combinations, and he works his jab pretty well, but his biggest drawback in his striking is that he will be backed up by guys that are willing to come forward. So that can be a problem for him. Uh, but in the grappling, he's good. He's got really good takedown entries, and he usually gets his opponent up against the cage and then starts working for takedowns from there. He'll do this thing where he gets around the, you know, around the hips, goes for the legs. If he doesn't get it initially, he'll, you know, reap the leg and pull them down that way. But if he doesn't, he switches, you know, switches style of takedown, get what he needs to do. Once he gets the fight to the, the ground, he'll usually try to take the back. Sometimes he'll take the back still standing against the cage and try to pull guys down from there. But from there, he's going to start looking for his rear naked choke as that is his best move. His best submission, I guess. Maybe not his best move, but his best submission. Um, so if this gets to the mat and Fletcher's able to take the back, he's going to have a lot of success with that rear naked choke. Uh, it's going to be hard to take a guy down that is that much bigger than you, but he's in luck because Ramashka doesn't have the best takedown defense. And we're going to cover that here in just a moment. We're going to start with his striking skills. In the striking for Ramashka, this guy is a solid striker and he puts his combinations together very well, mixes his punches and kicks, things like that. But sometimes that can lead him to getting taken down because he'll crash in just a little bit too much and be off balance when he's throwing a, a really nice combo. It just kind of puts him off balance. It doesn't happen all the time. It happens sometimes. It is what it is. Um, he's got plenty of power. He can put guys down, um, finish him that way, especially when he's the much bigger fighter. But the grappling. Decent grappler, right? But he, but the takedown defense is lacking, and that's a problem here. I don't like that for him in this matchup against Fletcher. But he is active from his back. He's going to use his long limbs to start throwing up submissions as well as, you know, he's got them choking arms, right, guys? He's got long, uh, slender arms. Um, so he's going to use the, the long limbs to throw up submissions, try to use that to get top position or get back to his feet um, if he doesn't land the submission, whatever. But for Ramaska, the, the issue he has is the takedowns. He's going to get taken down at, well, maybe not necessarily in this matchup because of the size. Maybe he's going to be able to use the size. It's going to be hard to say, but... The takedown defense, he's going to get taken down in his career because he, he doesn't seem to have that ability to really just get that wide base and then, you know, get the underhooks and and stop the takedowns consistently. But he's able to use size here, I think. And I think that's going to help him at least stop a couple of takedowns. And then because of that, I've got to go with Ramaska. I think this on the feet, he's going to be the much better striker. He's going to obviously have the range. He's a bigger guy by quite a bit. I think it's 5'11 to 5'8, give or take. Um, and I would say that Ramaska is going to be the better striker. And I think that's where this fight is going to take place early on. And I think that's what we're going to see. So for me, it's going to be Ramaska. I think he's just bigger. I think he's just 
you know, got the better striking. And I think if he does get taken down, he'll be able to be active enough that Fletcher's not be able to do a ton of damage. So we're going with Ross Gable. Let me know what you guys have in the comments below. And Interesting matchup here in the middleweight division between a couple of grapplers. And both guys obviously looking to grapple often ends up being a couple of guys that are grapplers striking it out for, you know, 15 minutes. Uh, in this one here, both of these guys, Andre Petrowski and Dylan Budka, they're both three and two in their last five fights. And like I said, they're both primarily grapplers. Uh, so when we look at these two here, for Dylan Budka, um, he's a good grappler. He's got good, powerful takedowns. He works to advance his position. Um, he's active if he ends up on his back, but he doesn't really do any damage. At least that's what we've seen so far. It's rare. Um, on the regional scene against some lower level guys, he was able to do a little bit. But even then, it still, it wasn't like... Um, He's not super, super dangerous in the grappling. Um, on the feet, he's got very wild striking. I don't know if it's good or bad. Um, I, it's, well, it's not clean. Let's put it that way. It's not, it's not pretty. But it can be effective because you know of the wrestling threat, the grappling threat. Um, and he's got pretty good volume. I'll give him that. But a lot of times, he's just looking for takedowns. That's what he wants to do. But like I said, if this ends up being a just a striking matchup between the two, I think he's going to have the better volume. Budka will. Now, when we look at, at Petrowski, Solid grappler. I think he's probably going to be just a little bit better in the grappling. He's got probably better. Um, he's probably got more technical takedowns, maybe not quite as powerful, um, but he definitely has better control and he does have an extremely tight squeeze. Now we've seen him subbed before, so the submission defense could be a concern, but I don't know that it will be a problem here. Budka's typically looking for control, which isn't, there's nothing wrong with looking for control. I just don't think that that's going to work out super well for him here. So for me, Petrovsky's a little bit better in the grappling. And when it comes to the striking, he's a little bit better there as well, but he does lack the volume um, compared to a guy like Budka. So if this ends up in the in the striking, we've got Petrovsky, who decent striker in the wrestling threat, usually opens up his hands, but I don't know that that'll actually happen here. This might actually not be something we can use for Petrovsky in this one because Budka's a pretty good wrestler in his own right. Um, but he does have power, but he loops everything. So... It's going to be the single shots of Petrovsky against the volume of Budka on the feet. I think, obviously, Petrovsky hits harder, uh, and I think that the volume edge is going to go to Budka. So if it ends up in a striking fight, it could be close when it comes to the scorecards. But I think the grappling edge is on the Petrovsky side, and unfortunately, I've got to pick him in this matchup. So we're going to take Andre Petrovsky to get this one done. Probably in a weird sort of striking matchup between grapplers. But let me know what you guys think. I appreciate you guys dropping your comments below with your picks and any other questions or comments you may have. So I will uh, I'll see you guys down there. We can interact a little bit. But until then, I'll see you. The women's next straw weights next, where Jacqueline Amarim takes on Vanessa Demopoulos. Now, both of these ladies are four and one in their last five fights. Both of these ladies trying to make their way up the division and looking like they're doing so quite well. Uh, when we look at this fight here, Demopoulos, she's a decent striker, uh, basically because she just got good forward pressure, enough power to make you feel it, and a lot of volume. That's what she's going to do. She doesn't defend strikes super well, but she's tough as nails. You're not going to just put her out, uh, but she's just going to keep coming forward, and she's going to keep throwing volume, and she's got enough power to make you feel it, and that's what matters. So on the feet, decent, but she's also pretty good on the mat. She does lack the ability to get the, the fight to the mat on her terms, which is unfortunate for her. And she can get stuck on the bottom, but she's extremely active from the bottom. She's going to be attacking submissions. She's going to be working elbows in. And she actually won a fight by doing that against uh, Kanaka Murata, which a lot of people thought she lost. However, the judges gave it to her. And a win is a win. And if she keeps on getting those wins, even when people think she lost, you know, it's going to keep paying out for her. So there is that. Um, if she does get on top, she does have pretty good control in the grappling department. I would say Demopoulos' jiu-jitsu is pretty good, but I do think Amarim has the more technical skill. It's just how is it going to compare when uh, Demopoulos is probably going to be the stronger, um, more physically advantageous fighter in this one. We have, we have to take that into account when we're looking at the grappling. So skill-wise, I think she's pretty good. I think Amarim's got the better grappling. But I think Vanessa is going to be stronger, so keep that in mind. Now, when we go over to the Amarim side on the street, on the feet, she on the street on the feet, she has powerful striking. Um, she gets she's a bit wild, and she's going to come forward. Now, if that forward pressure meets, who's going to win out? That's going to be hard to say. We'll find out really quick on Saturday because the person that starts taking the center of the octagon early is likely going to be the one winning the striking exchanges through the rest of the fight. Now, when it comes to the grappling, Amarim is probably, like I said, the more skilled grappler. She's got the ability to get the fight to the mat on her turn terms. She has good takedowns. She's got a large toolbox when it gets to the mat, good ground and pound, and she can attack submissions. The problem is she can get out-muscled by bigger and stronger opponents. And because of that, I think her cardio fades. I don't think she actually has bad cardio. I think it's more of a muscular fatigue. And what happens is, because uh, there's like there's different styles of cardio, right? There's, there's 
three that I really consider to be the styles of cardio, right? You've got, you've got your lung capacity. Your lungs could give out on you. Your, the breathing is failing you. Your heart, if your heart starts beating too fast, your cardio is going to give out on you there. But also you have the muscular fatigue. And that's what happens when you build up that like lactic acid in the muscles and things like that. And your, your, your arms start feeling really heavy. Your legs don't want to move anymore. That is what happens to Emery from my, from my understanding, from what I can tell. And so because she's getting out muscle and she's having to really do everything she can to finish some of this stuff, I think that's what causes her to gas out. So I don't think it's just, she just like doesn't do cardio. I think she's getting outsized. I think she should probably be an atom weight and that division isn't here. So when it comes to this matchup, like I said, it's going to be interesting to see who gets the center of the cage right away. I know a lot of people are going to be on Amarim and a lot of people are going to say Demopolis is, is bad and she doesn't win fights, but she keeps winning fights. I'm taking Vanessa Demopolis. She's going to win again. And whether anybody in the audience thinks she wins or not, she's probably going to get the win. I think she's going to have more volume on the feet. I think she's probably going to be able to out muscle in the grappling when she needs to. And I think she's going to have some moments where it doesn't look great for her, but I think overall she's going to get the win. So we're taking Vanessa Demopoulos. Let me know what you guys think. I do appreciate hearing from you guys in the comments. I will see you in featherweights the here. Gabriel Santos takes on Yija, and Yija is 4-1 and one in his last five fights after coming back and winning on the road to UFC after losing in the finals of the first tournament. Now, Gabriel Santos, 3-2 and two in his last five fights. He's on a two-fight skid after coming to the UFC against some very high-level competition and getting just getting the, the short end of the stick as far as the draw. When you when you end up coming into the UFC and you're fighting Lerone Murphy right out of the gate, sometimes it's just not going to go your way. You know what I mean? So for Santos, he is on a two-fight skid, back kind of up against the wall. He's now fighting a guy that's coming in with a decent bit of a momentum on his side in Yuzha. So for let's start on the Yuzha side. He is a decent striker with good forward pressure, long, rangy, straight punches, and pretty decent power, but his best weapon is his grappling. He has decent takedowns and decent top control. Basically, what he's going to do is he's going to come forward with his straights, boom, 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 throw in those straight punches until he can get in close enough to get the takedown. And once he gets the takedown, he's going to try and stay on top. Now, if you start to reverse position on him, that's when he tries to go for that arm bar, and he is pretty darn good with his arm bar. It is his best submission move. He can do it from top. He can do it from bottom. It's a good move for him. But his cardio is up there. He can continue to do this for a whole fight. So if Yija starts getting the grappling going early. I think that's his best path to victory in this matchup. Now, on the other side, we look at Gabriel Santos. He's a solid striker who can strike well from either stance. He's going to put together combinations. His knees up the middle are going to be crucial in this matchup to stop the takedowns of Yija. He's very quick, and he's also going to want to come forward. So that's going to help him out quite a bit if he's able to get uh, Yija on the back foot because it's harder to shoot a takedown when you're moving backwards than it is when you're moving forwards. Now, in the grappling, he can mix in takedowns of his own. I don't really know that he does that here. Um, he kind of does that against guys that are more primary strikers. I mean, he is active from his back, and he does attack submissions. But his biggest drawback is his takedown defense, and it's it's got holes. And I think that if Yuzha is able to capitalize on that, he could win the fight that way. But the more dangerous fighter is Gabriel Santos. I think Santos is probably going to be the better, more skilled fighter here. At the same time, the guy's coming off two losses in a row. He's got to think his job's on the line, and that can mess with a guy. That could either It could either give him that extra motivation he needs in training camp, or it could be something that makes him nervous, makes him tentative, and that could be a problem. So I'm going to take Santos with the caveat that, yeah, tread lightly. He's a big favorite, and a big favorite coming off of two losses is a scary thing to bet on. So Gabriel Santos is the pick. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. We are in the fight. flyweight division where Andre Lima takes on Felipe Dos Santos. Now, for Dos Santos, he's 4-1 in his last five. He's taking on the undefeated prospect in Lima. So he's 9-0, 5-0 in the last five. Now, one of those wins is a DQ win, so take that for what it is. But it's still a win. Um, the rest of them have looked pretty good. Now, when we look at this matchup here, we're going to start on the Felipe Dos Santos side. Felipe Dos Santos is a good striker. Reckless sometimes, but a good striker. He's going to come forward with a ton of volume. He's got a good leg kick. His front kick's up the middle, as well as his knees up the middle. I love those for him, especially in this matchup, because he can mix in the flying knee as well, and he can use that to crash the pocket and get in tight. If he can use that flying knee to come in tight and start landing what he wants to do and make this into chaos, because he is a bit of a wild fighter, I think that's going to play into his strengths here. Now, he's not going to be the cleaner striker, but sometimes a cleaner striker isn't necessarily what you're going to want to do to win. You know, sometimes you want to just make things ugly, and I think that's what Felipe Dos Santos can do. It's like they always say, you want to brawl a boxer and, brock, and box a brawler. Whoever's implementing their game plan against the other is going to be the one that's getting it done as far as what style of fight. Now, 
he is wild. Like I said, that does lead to some poor striking defense, but the dude's tough as nails. So I would be surprised if he just gets one shot knocked out or anything like that. So I do think Dos Santos is going to be able to with, uh, you know, withstand and endure anything that comes back his way as far as power. But I do think he can get touched up, and I think that could be a problem for him. Now, in the grappling, pretty good jujitsu as well. He's got decent takedowns, and he sets up with strikes. A lot of times it's because he's crashing that pocket and then goes for the takedown. His problem is he has really bad top control. He just lets guys back up because he's trying to attack submissions. He's very much submission over position, which can be good because you can get the sub, but it can be bad because then your opponent's getting back up, and then you got to retake him back down. Now, if he gets taken down, his defense isn't the best, but he's got a really good butterfly guard. He's able to kind of work things from there, whether that be a uh, submission attempts or sweeps or even to create a scramble and get back to his feet. So Dos Santos pretty good in the grappling, pretty good in the striking, makes fights dirty, makes uh, not dirty as in like cheating. We'll talk about that in a minute, but he makes fights ugly and he can use that to win fights pretty well. Obviously it's, you know, done pretty well for him. His only loss is to Mino Cop. So on the other side, Andre Lima, solid striker. The studio is a clean, clean striker, right? Power. He works the body really well, clean combos. His cross is absolutely beautiful. Um, step in elbows are nice and he's got really good leg kicks as well in the grappling department. I understand. I said good here. It is good. Dos Santos is going to be the better grappler, I believe, but they're both good grapplers. If that makes sense. Now, when it, when it comes to Lima, he's got decent takedown defense. And I think he can probably use that here to stop a couple of takedowns. But I do think if they're coming at the end of the strikes of Dos Santos, that takedown defense is going to have a harder time to, to keep him on his feet. Scrambles are good. He stays safe on the mat, really good at defending submissions, things like that. Um, he'll attack submissions to try to get the sweep. I don't know that that's going to work for him, though. So I think there are a couple of things in the grappling that have worked well for Lima in the past that I don't know are going to work against Dos Santos. I don't think that the attempts of the submissions are going to be enough of a threat to set up the sweep for uh, Lima for this one. I don't think those sweeps are coming because of that, because I think uh, Felipe Dos Santos is a, a higher level jujitsu player, I guess, than, than someone like Andre Lima. When it comes to you know the dirty fighting, like I was saying earlier, Andre Lima's a dirty fighter. Dude's going to grab the cage. Dude's going to grab your gloves. Dude's going to probably poke you in the eye. You know, he's going to do those things just because he knows he can get away with it. The guy's he's smart. That's what you should do in, in this stuff. So I could see him getting away with that, but I, it's a plus and minus because sometimes referees decide to take a point. Not often, but every now and then they do. And if they do, it sure messes up that round for you, right? Because if you're down a point, the best thing you can hope for is a tie in the round unless you just get a 10-8, which is also pretty rare. So for Andre Lima... This is something that's typically going to benefit him, but every now and then it's not. And when it doesn't, it's really a big drawback. So that's why it gets the plus minus. But for me in this one, I'm going to take Felipe Dos Santos to make this one ugly and get the win. I don't know if he's going to finish Andre Lima, but I think he's going to make it ugly enough that he can cause some serious damage. And I think that's going to get him the win and hand Andre Lima his first loss. So we're going Felipe Dos Santos in this one. Let me know what you guys have in this flyweight matchup. I love to hear from you guys, and I will see you in Featherweights the at 145 pounds, we have Isaac Dolgarian taking on Brendan Marot. Wrote three and two in his last five, four and one for Dolgarian and a very controversial loss. A lot of people thought he won, a lot of people thought he lost. Depends what side you bet on. When we break this one down, Brendan Marot, decent striker, decent power, pretty good counters, uh, but his striking defense is a little lackluster. In the wrestling, he's got decent takedowns and he's got pretty good scrambles as well, but his takedown defense isn't the best. And that's the biggest red flag for him in this one because he's going against Isaac Dolgarian, who's a very strong wrestler. This guy has solid takedown entries, an absolutely beautiful single leg, secures his possession well. He can mat return if he needs to. Got excellent scrambles. His ground and pound is absolutely vicious where he brings those elbows in. And the best thing is he's going to use his straight punches just to close that distance and then go right into that grappling. So he's not going to waste time trying to Tr tr trying to strike in this matchup and open up the risk of getting caught. The guy's going to come in with his straight shots just to set up the takedowns, get the takedowns going. He's going to do it at a high pace. However, his cardio can fade if he is forced to work really, really hard for the first two rounds, and in the third, he can fade. Now, I don't see that happening here. Isaac Dolgarian should get this one done. Brendan Burrow is a good fighter. He's just not He's not Isaac Dolgarian, who is an absolute beast of a wrestler and a beast of a prospect. So we're taking Isaac Dolgarian here. I think he gets this one done, and I feel like you guys probably knew that before we got to this one. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you at light heavyweight, where a couple of guys who are two and three in their last five look to get their feet in the right position, looking to get moving forward, and looking to get on track. Ryan Spann takes on Ovin St. Pru. Now, for Ovin, the guy's been around for ages. Do you guys remember clear back in, like, Gosh, the early 20 teens, probably when this guy fought John Jones in a title match back, you know, for the you know light heavyweight title long before the controversy with the Dominic Reyes fight, long before 
John Jones moved up to uh, heavyweight. This is this is a long time ago, but Ovens has been around for a while. So OSP, he's 41 now. He's much older than he was then. He's not the up-and-coming prospect anymore. He's now the grizzled vet. He's taking on Ryan Spann, who's 33, probably the prime of his life, prime of his or of athletic life anyway, for this division at 205. He's got a couple of good years still because, I mean, 33 at light heavyweight is still pretty young. The guy can get things done as far as physically. He is extremely fast starter. He's an extremely athletic guy, but he can be kill or be killed, and he's not exactly the best nail. But by gosh, is he a good hammer. So for Ryan Spann, all of the, the physical things, being younger, more athletic, big, you know, quick starter, you know, just gets going. He's going to have the physical advantages here. He's a decent striker as well with a ton of power, but he throws a lot of single shots. He's a decent grappler as well, and he's got pretty good front chokes. But as the fight goes on, his skills are kind of diminished because he's going against a guy in OSP who's kind of slow and steady. Tortoise in the hairstyle. The dude's a tortoise. He just slow and steady wins the race, right? Uh, for Ovince, same Pru. The guy's a good striker with good power and good countering ability. But his output in his last fight wasn't bad, but it typically has been kind of low. Um, and also he throws a lot of single shots in his own right. So he's going to be you know moving backwards a lot of the time, looking to counter strike. That could go well for him against Ryan Spann, but it could also go really poor against Ryan Spann because Ryan Spann, if he's able to close the distance and land a big shot, probably going to drop OSP. However, he's coming forward and OSP decides to counter him and knock him down. He could knock out Ryan Spann. It's one of those things at, at light heavyweight where either guy could knock each other out. Both guys hit pretty hard, and it is what it is. In the grappling, I think that the skill is going to be on the OSP side. I think he's got decent takedowns, and I think he can use that here. Uh, but I also think that he's very opportunistic in the submissions. And what I see happening, this is going to, I'm going to get so much crap for this. I understand it. It's okay. Nobody's going to, it's like I said in the, in the intro, we just taking some dog shots this week and we're going to hope we can at least get around 50% on our picks. And we're going to hope that we can really hit the big dogs and get to, to get some big money that way. So we're taking OSP to win by Von Flu Choke or Von Pru Choke, as I have here, because he wins a lot that way. And Ryan Spann loves his guillotines. So if Ryan Spann jumps a guillotine, I can see uh, Ovin St. Pru hitting that Von Flu choke and, and getting the win over Ryan Spann. So that's what I think is going to happen. I'm going to take OSP to get the win, and I think it's going to happen with uh, the Von Flu choke. So let me know what you guys think. I'm sure it's not going to be thrilled about that pick. Lightweight we'll see next. next. Rong Zhu takes on Chris Padilla. Both of these guys are 4-1 and one in their last five fights, and I think this is an interesting clash of style matchup. So when we look at these two here, Chris Padilla, he is a decent striker, but we know he's a better wrestler. He's a decent striker who works his jab pretty well, and he keeps that right hand right up by his chin the entire time because it, unless he's throwing, obviously, that hand, but it goes right back here. So he'd be working his jab out, but that hand is glued to the face, and that's something that you want to see, especially fighting a heavy-handed striker like he is in this matchup. So I do like that. Grappling, this is where he gets things done. He has good wrestling, ability to push the fight up against the cage, work the body lock, takedown, and he's got very good top control. When he gets on top, He'll secure his position, and then he starts working for the ground and pound, and he goes straight to the elbows. He doesn't mess around with those hammer fists or anything like that. He's going right to throwing elbows. His elbows cause a lot of damage, and by golly, that's what he's going to do. Chris Padilla, I love the wrestling in, for him in this one because he's going against a guy who's pretty much a striker to the core, right? Rong Zhu, good striker with absolutely brutal leg kicks. Puts together combinations. He's got plenty of power on the feet, and he's fast. He can strike quickly. His takedown defense has been suspect in the past. And we have seen him controlled on the mat, and that's typically how he's losing fights. Now, when we look at these two, it's it's tough to say who's going to win when it's striker versus grappler. And we saw Rung Zhu was able to, you know, do, do okay against the, you know, and win actually, and do, and do pretty well at stopping takedowns against the wrestler in Shin Haraguchi. However, Haraguchi was in the wrong weight class. Let's be honest. The guy's still in the wrong weight class fighting at featherweight. The dude could probably be a bantamweight because he's very small. So Rongju defending takedowns there, although it's impressive, it's not as impressive as if it was somebody that's the proper size. So it does still leave me with some question marks, and I think that Padilla, as a big-time underdog, is somebody that can probably capitalize on that. And I'm going to take Chris Padilla, and by golly, I know a lot of people are going to be on the other side, and that's okay. I think Chris Padilla, Chris Padilla can get the takedowns, and even if he just has to lay on him from half guard, which is where he likes to, that's what half means there. That's what Chris Media likes to do, get to half guard and do what he needs to do from there. And I think he can just stay on top, landing elbows, or just even just controlling for three rounds if he needs to. So I'm going to take Padilla. I think the wrestling advantage is there, and I don't think we, we've we seen enough for me to believe that Rung Zhu's takedown defense is where it needs to be. So, Big Padilla, let me know what you guys think. And this I'll see lightweight you bout should be an absolute knockdown, drag-em-out, slobber-knocker of a fight. 
We've got Trevor P. kicking on Yanal Ashmos, and this fight, it's going to be fun. It might not be pretty, it might not be super technical, but it's going to be fun to watch. It's going to be one of those fights that reminds you that, you know what, I know this is a sport, and I know that these are, these are martial artists in here. Sometimes you just got to get gritty, and that's what we're going to see here. We're going to see a gritty fight between a couple of guys that are tough as nails. Uh, they're tougher than a $2 steak, an old leather, leather boot. Like these guys, just when you think of tough, you, you think of these guys, right? Uh, for you know, Ashmo's 4-1 and one in his last five fights. Um, his last loss, I mean, the dude broke his arm in like the first round and just continued to fight through until decision. Tough dude. Um, Trevor Peak 3-2 and two in his last five. When he's losing, it's not for lack of lack of trying to take the other guy's head off. He's, he keeps things close. He's durable, and he comes at you. So it's these these guys are both doing what they need to do to make fights close. Now, when we look at Ash Moose, he's a good striker. He's got good power, good volume. Something I was impressed with in his last fight was his head movement. He showed pretty good head movement. Um, he's obviously durable, like I said, and he closes the distance well. Now, I think that's going to be easy here because I think both of these guys are going to be coming forward the whole time. Uh, in the wrestling department, Ashmos has decent wrestling. He can get the takedowns. They're okay, but he's got good top pressure. Once he gets the fight down, he does have good top pressure. We're looking at Trevor Peak now. Trevor Peak, a decent striker. He's not technical or pretty by any means, but the dude's got a ton of power. He's got good volume. His defense isn't really there, but he's super durable. You get you can't knock this guy out. You get him in the head with a baseball bat. The dude's gonna keep coming at you. Um, he does swing kind of wild, and his leg kicks. He'll throw them from just like way out, and they're just naked. But that's it's not what you want to see. But doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Hit him in the face? Cool. Bring it on. He's just going to walk on through it and swing big bombs at you. So in the wrestling, he can mix in takedowns of his own, but he can also get taken down. Now, he does bounce back to his feet fairly quickly, but it is something that, that will disrupt his offense. Um, his pace is going to be incredible. The dude just keeps coming, whether, whether he's tired or not. He's like those old Energizer Bunny commercials, just beating that little drum and just coming on forward. That's what he's going to do. Uh, tough one to call. Tough fight to call. I think it's going to be back and forth. I think both guys, are, I think it's going to be really close. The line suggests that as well. I think this is a fight where you end up having to just take a pick and hope for the best. Um, but what I think is going to be the decision maker for the judges is I think, you know, Ashmos is going to land more takedowns. And I know that that sounds weird because the judges aren't supposed to favor that. But I think what they're going to say is that was a wild brawl on the feet. And I don't know who won it, but I mean, I guess Ashmos went landed some takedowns. So we'll go with him. And that's what I think they're going to do. So we're going to take, you know, Ashmos with zero confidence. I'm rooting for Trevor Peak. I like Trevor Peak. Uh, it was his contender series fight against Malik, uh, Malik Lewis, I think it was, uh, where we picked him and I, all of his, like, not all of, but a lot of Trevor Peak's friends and family showed up in the comments. And uh, we picked Trevor, Trevor Peak, that is. And they were awesome folks. We had a great time. Um, we were all talking in the comments during the fight and how after the first round, after he just got his head caved in, basically comes back, you know, we're like, hey, he's not out of this thing. This thing's a, this guy's a dog. And then he comes out and wins it and, like, so I'm, 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 I'm a big fan of not only Trevor Peak, but Trevor Peak's fans, which is wild. It's like his close personal friends and family who made it out to that thing. So if you guys are still watching the channel, I hope you are. That'd be fantastic. I'm rooting for Trevor Peak. I think the judges are going to give it to Ashmo's here. Let me know what you guys think, though, and I will see you in the comments below. Um, also, if you if you found this helpful so far, like the video while you're down there. I do appreciate it. I'll see you guys in an interesting time. fight. A really, really good fight here at Featherweight. Steve Garcia takes on Kyle Nelson. Now, this shout out to the matchmakers here. This is a good fight. Both of these guys, 16 and 5. Obviously, there's the draw for Kyle Nelson. The records line up great. 3 1 and 1 in the last five, 4 and 1 in the last five. Like these guys are right there at the same trajectory. Who's moving on? Basically, this is I love the I love the matchmaking. Both guys are similar in their skill set. In fact, this is probably the most even matchup we've seen in a long time on paper. Now, when we get to the fight, we'll find out. But on paper, this is probably one of the more even matchups, just side by side, that we've seen in a long time, and I love it. So for Steve Garcia, I'm going to start over there. He's a good striker with good forward pressure. He's got pretty good footwork with his kind of boxing style, um, power, volume. He's got them both, and he's been getting his his finishes because of that. That power and that volume. He's got good wrestling as well with some pretty good takedown defense, top control. And if he gets on top, that ground and pound is going to mess you up. So on the other side, he's fighting Kyle Nelson, a guy that just continually proves people wrong. And that's what he's been doing in his last five fights, honestly. Um, decent, uh, good striking with decent power. Uh, he's got the good high guard like so, and he's going to slam those body kicks. His body kick is by far his best weapon. If he lands that body kick on Garcia, Garcia is going to be in some trouble because that body kick does suck the wind right out of guys. Now. When it comes to his wrestling, he's got decent takedown defense as well. Um, pretty good top control. 
this is basically like a mirror matchup as far as like skill sets. But it comes down to like who do you pick, right? Um, what I'm gonna do. Look, Kyle Nelson's the type of guy that has uh, proved me wrong a lot, and for whatever reason, I keep underestimating the guy. Um, and I'm gonna do it again, but not really, because here's what I'm saying. I'm gonna say what you're gonna do is you're gonna kick back. Put your feet up on that coffee table. You're going to crack open a nice cold root beer, and you're just going to watch this fight and enjoy it. And then when Kyle Nelson does that thing where he just shows us that he's better than we're giving him credit for once again, you don't have to feel so bad because you didn't lose any money on it. But we're going to take Steve Garcia with his head of steam to get this one done because, gosh, he's looked so good lately. But then again, so is Kyle Nelson. I don't know. But I'm going to take Steve Garcia. Stay away. Guys, stay away from this fight. I'll Wait, see you in the next Next, one. Jessica Andrade takes on Natalia Silva. And for Natalia Silva, it's been nothing but success in the UFC at 5-0 and in her last five fights. She's taking on Jessica Andrade, who's been there, done that, former champion. She's 2-3 and three in her last five, but she's had moments where she's looked really good and moments where she's looked pretty bad. So it kind of just depends which fight you're watching as for what Jessica Andrade you're getting at this point in her career. Uh, when we look at the skills, we look for Natalia Silva here with solid striking, good, very good movement. She's able to move forward or backwards and strike well from either either direction um she's got pretty good power and her kicks are probably some of her best weapons and she can do that to every level but the body kick is her is her best kick in my opinion body kick is absolutely savage and i think that's something she's going to want to use here in the grappling she's got good grappling as well she's got good trip takedowns she can get on top and control if she ends up on her back she can sweep but the takedown defense is pretty good she's got good scrambles the one red flag I've seen is that she can be held against a cage for minutes at a time. It's happened to her before. It's probably going to happen to her again, but typically she can make opponents pay once she's able to get away from the cage and make up for that lack of, of time where she's been on offense and you know usually can cover the ground. However, it is something to make note of. On the other side, for Jessica Andrade, she's a good striker, and she's got good forward pressure and a ton of power, and she keeps that power late. That that power is there from round one to round five if it's a title fight. Obviously, this one is not a title fight, but she keeps that power late. She's got pretty good volume, but she can be open to counters when she gets a little bit aggressive, and she can get a little bit aggressive because she starts extremely fast. She's going in there trying to get the fight over with, trying to get you out of there early, and that is sometimes how she gets open for counters. Now, in the grappling department, she's decent, uh, mostly offensively. Defensively, eh. But offensively, she's got very good ground and pound, and she likes to get people to the mat by picking them up and slamming them down on the mat. She doesn't have these, like, you know, super technical takedowns, but she will toss you, and she will throw you on the mat. So for me, this one is basically just a changing of the guard. I think I think Jessica Andrade still has a lot to give in the division, uh, but I think she's better suited for, uh, for straw weight, and I think that at flyweight here, Natalia Silva is one of the better prospects in the division, and I think she's going to get it done. So we're going to go with Natalia Silva. To get this one done, ah, the method of victory is incredibly tough to call. It's either going to be some sort of a TKO or a decision. I'm going to go with a decision because Andrade is tough. I'm going to say that that Silva, that Silva can probably get a decision and look pretty gosh darn good in this fight. But let me know what you guys think, and I will see you in the next one. Now at Welterweight, where Gilbert Burns takes on Sean Brady. Now, for Sean Brady, the guy's only 31 years old, still kind of coming into his prime in the welterweight division, but he's amassed a pretty good record at 16-1, and 4-1 and one being in the last five, his only loss being to the current champion of the division. Now, on the other side, Gilbert Burns. Dude's been around the block for a while, right? This guy's been here. He's done that. He's fought the who's who. He also has a loss to the current champion, but, uh, but he's also, you know, he's fought pretty much everybody. He's fought for the title before. Didn't, didn't end up getting it, but he's fought for the title before. He's fought everybody at the top, or at least close to. But he's 38 years old, and that's what happens. When you fight everybody at the top, you start to get older. And when you get older, your record doesn't look as good on the last five. He's two and three because the level of competition has been very steep. But competitive matchup here, right? It's the guy that, that's been there for a while, the grizzled vet, taking on the up-and-comer. Now, the up-and-comer in Sean Brady, we're going to start on his side. He has solid grappling. It's extremely strong grappling. Let's put it that way. This guy is probably one of the better grapplers in the UFC. Uh, I would say he's he might be the best top control, top side grappler in this division, I would say. Best top side grappler. Take that for what it is. He's going to use the cage to secure his takedowns. He can also kick, uh, catch kicks to secure takedowns as well. Those are the two ways he typically likes to do it. He likes to back guys up against the cage get the takedown, or catch a kick, get the takedown. Now, like I said, excellent control. Typically from half guard, excellent control. 
He's got topside chokes that he uses as well, such as the arm triangle, which is a very effective move uh, without giving up too much position because if you start to feel the choke start to slip, what you do is you get back up on top. And typically you'll be able to get that because you keep that one foot kind of locking down the, uh, the outside leg there or the I guess the inside leg of your opponent. I, obviously you can't see my leg. It doesn't matter what I just did there. But you use your leg to keep their their leg from blocking you from going back into mount when when the time comes. So or into half guard, which is where he likes to sit. So you, you keep the leg so you can go right back to it. So that arm triangles are efficient for keeping the top. He also has that single arm guillotine he likes to lock up from top um, at, or from half guard. Really, it's it's wild. It's a wild submission. You don't really see anybody else use it. Um, he likes to bait his opponents by landing some ground and pound. Now, what does he do? He baits them into trying to move. So he can either take better position or snatch up a submission. The guy's very good at using that, that ground and pound to bait his opponents to make the decision he wants them to make. In the striking, it's he gets a bad rap for getting outstruck by Bilal Muhammad, but so did Leon Edwards. So take that for what you will. Now, the dude's got a good leg kick and he's got a good overhand. I wouldn't say he's a very good striker, but he does have those two things there. His striking defense hasn't done well for him in the past. Um, he's been beat up quite a bit by a few guys, but he's always able to counter his grappling to get things done. On the other side, it's Gilbert Burns. This guy's been here, like I said, for a long time, and he's shown the skills that he's got. We have a pretty good read on Gilbert Burns, but it's to what level is he still? Because he's coming off of some, some injuries. Um, he's he's uh, in his Bala Muhammad fight. Like the guy, he was injured the whole fight, basically. Um, didn't really have any offense whatsoever. Uh, but that, I mean, the injury didn't help, right? But he's also getting up there in age, so he's going to get more injuries. You know, how much does he have left in the tank? That's the question we're going to have to ask. But when we're looking at just the skills, this dude is an extremely high-level jiu-jitsu player, right? He's not likely going to be the guy to get on top of Sean Brady because Sean Brady's going to be the the more aggressive grappler in the, uh, offensively. But if you get Gilbert Burns on his back, he it's it's not a safe safe play, right? It's not a safe time. You don't want to be there a lot of the times on top of Gilbert Burns. Because this guy, he's got control from everywhere. Whether he's on bottom or top, he's controlling the position. Uh, at least most of the time. He's using that skill. I'm not going to say all the time because Sean Brady's pretty good. But he's using that jujitsu skill he has to control his opponents, not let them posture up, not let them go for their submissions on top. And then he's looking for his ability to reverse the position and then advance position to where he's in the place that he wants to be. He's got near-perfect defense on the mat. And he's extremely tough to deal with in the grappling. That's why most people have cho chosen to strike with him. But the problem for Gilbert Burns is he's typically willing to strike with those guys. Now, in this matchup, it's probably his best path, but he has been, it, been willing to strike with people in the past when his grappling should have been his best path. Now, uh, for the striking, Gilbert Burns, he's probably going to be the better striker here. He's a good striker with good forward pressure. He likes that block and return style. So what I can see happening here is Sean Brady throwing that big, wild overhand, um, throwing some power behind it. But what happens is Gilbert Burns blocks it, and then he returns with a strike of his own. That's how Gilbert Burns like to fight. He's not throwing a big, big, heavy pressure combos, but he's going to come forward, block your shot, and come back with one, and that's what he's looking to do, and he does a good job with it. He's got plenty of power and extremely hard leg kicks. The one problem, though, is he eats leg kicks back, and he just doesn't care. Um, he doesn't really check them very often, doesn't try to get out of the way of them. He'll just eat the leg kick and then come back up top with a boxing combination. I like it, and I don't like it. It's one of those things where, yeah, I mean, he's landing the boxing combination, but he got hit in the leg. So what ends up first? This is an extremely hard one to pick. This is a tough fight. This is a good main event. I absolutely love it. I'm going to start with the younger guy, though. I'm going to take Sean Brady. And let me tell you why. That was a bad check mark. There we go. I think Sean Brady is going to be able to get the takedown. And I think once he gets the takedown, I think he's going to be able to stay on top and win a lot of minutes. And I think that's what we're going to see here. Do I think Gilbert Burns can win this fight? Absolutely, I do. But do I think Sean Brady wins this fight more often than not? Yes. And I think it's because he's going to be able to stay on top not get submitted, and even if Gilbert Burns is doing everything right on, on off of his back, I think Sean Brady is going to be on top doing what he needs to do to get the win. So we're going to go with Sean Brady here. It's a five-round fight, so later in the fight, who knows what can happen. We haven't really seen Sean Brady in those situations, but this will be a chance to figure it out. I don't recommend being overexposed either side in this matchup. Maybe just watch it, whatever you got to do. If you feel like you have to bet the main event, do what you must, but I'm taking Sean Brady for my pick. I will, I'd will. i love to see you guys down in the comments below. And if you haven't done it already, please do me a favor and like this video. It does go a long way to helping the channel. So thank you guys so much, and I will see you in the next one.